Hi. Hi. Oh, good. You're all connected. Oh my gosh, that's great. I'm actually trying to get my, I'm actually harassing Snake, my, my husband, to come get my little puppy who is chewing on my chair legs. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? How are you? Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, it's a thrill to have you on the show. There's a lot of people who are looking forward to seeing you on on our podcast and hearing you, of course. You're it, awesome. Sorry, I just have to get my dog. Come here. That's okay. Come, come here. Oh, she is nine months old. This is Ace. Oh, hi, sweetie. <laughs> I know this is Ace Freely. Oh, great I'm name. Kidding. There's yeah, a big. Well, there's a... my husband is a massive Kiss fan. He's a Kiss collector and a Kiss fan. So I was going to ask the dog. Yeah, this. Hence that. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> the whole place is a Kiss museum. Wow. Well, I wanted to ask you before we start, is it okay? Um, it's totally up to you if we use any of the video from this for doing promo for the show or of putting course. it on our YouTube channel. Okay. Of course. I just want to make sure that, because sometimes people are like, no, I just want to do the audio part and that's totally okay. So. I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah, but I guess, well, if long you don't mind my, my headphones. Oh no, it's perfect. <laughs> okay. Have you been awesome. doing a lot of the Zoom stuff lately? All year. Yeah all year long yeah lots of, but I mean it's fun you know like I really like I like the format I like zoom a lot mm -hmm. and uh it's fun to do interviews where you can actually see somebody I yeah. think anyway yeah I, I've done probably 80 percent of them on zoom and so far I've really mm -hmm. loved it oh good over Skype or anything like that Skype's a little glitchy mm -hmm. I was using it in the beginning but it's been a few months now so we've kind of figured out what works and what doesn't you know mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done a variety of different things, but Zoom seems to always consistently be the, I guess, just the easiest. Well, I have some questions for you about um, the past as well, because this is a 90s kind of retro podcast, but I have a lot cool. of questions about the new stuff that's coming out. So that'll, oh, cool. that'll be coming up later. Okay. Um, so welcome to Don't Nostalgia, of course. Now, the first time mm -hmm. I saw you was in the Moist video, believe me. Oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Lots now, you, of fun. And you had done a few different music videos at that time, right? With other bands. Um, I had done, I wound up doing two for Moist. And um, I think by that time we had, I think uh, I had made a video for telling you and daddy's getting married, I think by that time. Oh, yeah. uh, so videos were just kind of starting to um, become something that indie bands were able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we would, uh, we would apply for grants and, and get a chance to do videos. And it was, it was a, a great era. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How it did was you, fantastic. you must've known the guys already in Moist. Cause how did you get cast in the videos? Um, I think that we did shows with them mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, when I was, uh, when I first embarked on a solo career, I had come from being in bands. And the bands that I was in had toured across Canada and, and the U.S., uh, but definitely w would not have crossed paths with Moist. We were in like, you know, um, punk bands and stuff like that, thrash bands. And so yeah. um, Moist was a big band at the time. They were big stars. And for me as an indie artist and as a female, I was, I was really, uh, really grateful for the chance to play with them on, on Bill's. No kidding. I mean, I was mm -hmm. a huge fan as well at that time. Um, mm -hmm. The Silver Album and yeah, it was Fantastic. a really good time in Canadian rock music. And I mean, like you said, you came from more of like the punk side of things. So mm -hmm. were you enjoying the way things were going at that time for you? Or what about like the record label and all of that? Was, was it going all right? Um, well, you know, I only know the experience that I had, which mm -hmm. I, you know, I couldn't, it's not that I took it personally, but I knew because I was like, a chick that it was going to be a different experience mm -hmm. um we made a record uh and then the label folded about a week after the record was released no and way. the big distribution uh label didn't want me as an artist so they didn't want to pick up the record at all and told my manager that I would never get on the radio and that nobody's ever going to listen to a girl with tattoos and to cut his losses and to drop me as an artist and all this stuff and I think I was like 23 uh, years old and I was ready to just go back to university. I thought, well, that was really cool that I was able to, you know, tour in these bands and that's cool. 
Mm -hmm. um, but then we just like formed our own record company and started licensing the record in Europe. And the first label that was interested in me was a dance label in Germany. And we wound up going to Germany, oh, wow. but they were distributed by Roadrunner over there. So we toured with Life of Agony in 96 all over Europe. And that opened me up to a whole new audience over there, which was more appropriate for what I wanted to do. And I kind of thought, I don't ever have to come back to Canada. <laughs> This is great. I'm like, this is great. This is like a lot of a lot of bands and a lot of rock bands wound up finding their, I guess, their wings in uh, in Europe and mm. uh, and in Japan and places like that. I mean, Germany at that time too was probably the third largest music market in the world. I mean, it was just such. A, it was amazing. It was amazing times. Embracing rock music over there is the big thing about Europe that I appreciate so much mm -hmm. because. No disrespect to Canada or North America in general, but I would think as an artist, I would way rather try to make it in Europe. Well, if, it was, if you're, if it you're was in the great rock, training the rock ground. Genre. Yeah, yeah, it was a great training ground. I mean, being in a punk band in Canada is the best way to get your uh, get your tour legs, really, because the drives are <laughs> farther than anywhere else you're ever going to tour in your life, probably. Yeah. And you're probably going to be poor and you're probably going to sleep in a van. So I always thought that that was a really good, you know, learning curve, you know, so that everything after that seems yeah. quite easy. And, uh, and when you go and uh, do interviews in places where they are very deliberate with what they're asking you, and I wish this for any young artist, uh, go do a press tour. Mm -hmm. uh, some in some other country because you're going to learn to get your answers really concise and you're going to you're going to figure it out quickly because you'll either get misquoted or they won't understand what you're saying you know you can't oh, that's true yeah so it, it was just a really great learning experience and then when we came back to Canada we wound up signing with uh, a label here and and, uh, and then in the states and the rest is history i mean so, i was on i've been on tour since i was 18 i don't know it's it, kind of like a blessing sense. like yeah. a blessing in disguise that that label folded when it did because it just changed the tra trajectory of your path and absolutely and you could say that for absolutely everything that happens i'm a real predestinist um and i i love that i love the story of overcoming and I think that all of us overcome something probably every week, really, even if it's a little mm -hmm. thing. And it just makes, especially, especially in the, in the business as a, as a woman, you know, it was a really different experience. And I'm sure that a lot of uh, women either in radio and broadcasting or in acting or in, in uh, music will all say the same things. It's just, you have to be kind of twice as tough <laughs> and if they're a thick skin. I've been blessed to the fact that I've gotten to talk to a lot of wonderful, strong women now over on the show who are inspiring to me, like yourself. Um, that's why I'm glad. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> uh, cool. I hold you. I hold you in very high regard as a role model for women. So, what do you think? Oh, bless your heart. What do you think women can do nowadays to lift each other up instead of like catty <sighs> bullshit and, you know. You no, know, like uh, all the, you know, all the mean girl stuff and the caddy stuff, I was always kind of oblivious to it. I'm a real, you know, in high school too, I was a real overcompensator. Mm. Um, so, you know, if the grade nine girls didn't like me, the first thing I'm going to do is go be a, like a total ass kisser. I mean, that's just my nature. You know, I was the class clown and, and that's never changed. I think who we were in the 11th grade is who we are at 30. You know, yeah. nothing really changes. And, uh, and so I think that it lent itself, um, having that kind of personality. I think for me anyway, it lent itself to uh, developing a good rapport with people over the years and, uh, and just, you know, never taking things personally. Yeah. Uh, because especially in music and with touring, more than other women being competitive or weird with me it was always guys yeah um, always and uh, you know I, well I can't say for sure but as you know for a long time I was the only female on bills mm -hmm. uh that were you know rock bills and you know once it was established that I wasn't there to blow anybody huh. 
you know, that I was there to, you know, rock, um, then the animosity began. Yeah. And that was fine. You know, I, ne- again, I never took it personally. Yeah. Um, ever. But it was, it, it definitely was interesting. And now as I'm, you know, older and uh, wanting to manage young artists myself as a manager, you know, I look back on those experiences and I say to young artists, you have to be, you just have to be really resilient, really polite, always, no matter what someone says to you, no matter what they're doing, you know, they can't sabotage your show. They can't, you know, they can't do anything like that. They can't, you know, do anything untoward toward you. Uh, Whereas back in the day, it was very different. There was no Me Too movement in the 90s, believe Mm -hmm. me. Uh, so, you know, girls had to fend for themselves in some of these rock venues and um, it made us tough. It made us really tough and it made us rock really hard. You know, we had we had no choice but to rock a little harder. No kidding. Now, when writing your memoirs, Ibificus, what was going into the realm of being an author like for you? Had you done writing pr- previously to that? Uh, Just lyrics and poetry, you know, and it was easy to enshroud all of these traumas or or childhood or adolescent traumas in lyrics. That's no problem. Singing about it, no problem, because you're, you know, using lots of metaphors and and people kind of glean their own stuff out of it. Uh, But actually writing the factual stories and the memoirs, I mean, you know, it, I started uh, writing it for the purpose of writing a memoir, you know, and it was not my idea. It was my manager's idea, of <laughs> course, which is why he's the manager. Um, and I just thought, you know, it was probably because I didn't croak of breast cancer or heart surgery. And that's why he wanted to make sure I got my memoir out because I thought it was a little early. Um, but it was really difficult and it was hard to um, truthfully tell those stories um, not that I felt I hadn't healed from some of those wounds, but it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. It really is. And, and anyone will tell you whether it's going through cancer or health scare or, or going through trauma and then relaying your trauma. There's part of there's Sure. There's part of it that's empowering to sell, tell your story, but it's also, you still have those little pangs of shame that you grew up with mm-hmm. and, uh, and they never go away. And even if you think that you're cool, once you're writing them out, they, they kind of sneak up on you and it gets weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those stories in, in that book are the ones that I was legally allowed to tell. That's what we always <laughs> say. Those are the ones that I was allowed to tell. You know, everything else was uh, put aside. But not, um, I'm not, not a, you know, I'm not a tattletale or a rat and I am not a grudge holder uh, by any means. And so I, I think that I think it was a good balance of humor Mm-hmm. and uh and sensitivity in in the telling it's the first time i'd written anything like that so it was a, a big undertaking it was a year to write and then three years to work with the editor on. yeah oh, okay i was gonna say when you finally put the last touches to the book and it's ready to go out it's got to be a different feeling than when you put out an album it's so different and it's also it, it's also because in those three years lots had happened to me and since then I mean it came out in 2016 that's five years ago my life is so different now Mm -hmm. and uh and things that have occurred in my life I never ever would have seen uh you know the the date of publication of that book in 2016 so it makes me laugh now I feel like I could write another book (laughs) well yeah um five years a lot can happen and even in as we all know now what happened in one year (laughs) wild i mean it's like it's a movie it, we're living yeah. in a movie man and it's a, it's a horror show mm-hmm. yeah yeah i'm starting to actually like i'm starting to really try to work more on my mental health now because i kind of just forgot the feeling for the last seven eight months that oh i'm fine i'm fine but you keep saying that but then you're like no i've kind of been by myself for a while now maybe i should like get out <laughs> You yeah, know. it it does get weird and it's isolating. And even for introverts, it gets isolating and just things yeah. that we don't think about, like, yeah, like grabbing a coffee or, or riding on the bus is, it, you know, we think it's a solitary activity in a way because we don't talk to anybody. No. Um, however, that interaction, that human interaction is like, you know, it's, it's how we grew up. It, and now there's going to be, you know, a generation of kids 
you know, at this point, it's like they don't know any different than masks. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. No, it's true. But when things go back to normal, I'm going to really appreciate those small things like going to get a cup of coffee and, you know, people That's watching right. on the bus. They'll, they'll, it'll be different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have a few questions from some of the listeners. Um, this, one's oh, from, cool. this one's from Jonah. Um, he'd like to know what the most influential author you've ever read is. Uh, I would have to say that is a poet named Irving Layton. And uh, Irving Layton is a Canadian poet. And the first time I read Irving Layton, I was 15 years old. And he was dirty. His poetry was dirty. It was a little bit erotic. And it was, um, it was just, it just, man, it just opened my brain. It's put my mind open. And so I've been collecting Irving Layton books. Uh, They're mostly out of print now um, for, yeah, for over 30 years. Hmm. And, uh, and I just, I just, I just love his writing. I love his writing and his poetry. And definitely he influenced me a lot. Wow. How many works has he put out? I don't know, like a, a couple dozen for sure. A few mm. dozen. Yeah. Nice. It's like, yeah, if you, if you Google Irving Layton or, you know, any like the Canadian Poets Society or anything, you'll find lots of his stuff. Um, but yeah, he was the earliest influence on me as a writer and uh, continues to be. Awesome. Now, Kendra wants to know, how did the opportunity to be on the L word come to be? And what was that experience like? Um, I don't know how I wound up on the L word. Um, I lived in Vancouver for 30 years. And I've always been a member of ACTRA, the acting uh, organization, the acting union. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a few acting gigs. I was a theater major in high school and college. So it's kind of what I thought I would be doing. Yeah. Instead of saying I never sang or anything uh, before I went on tour. And um, I don't know. uh, The opportunities that I have gotten have been really nurturing and really cool. And being on the L Word was a really amazing experience. Everyone was so nice. And, you know, those sets always have snacks. And, uh, uh, just, yeah it's just really it's fun you know for someone like yeah. me who is not used to it it's really fun and being on the show was really great was that one of those shows that was uh, shot in Vancouver yes okay in Hollywood North yes that probably provided you a lot of opportunities to get involved with acting of course would you yes. ever con- would you consider taking the Jan Arden route and developing your own show from your mouth to God's ears I mean who wouldn't you know and and <laughs> And her show's amazing, but it's not surprising because she is hilarious. She's naturally funny. She's gifted. Um, yeah. And, and she's, yeah, she's fantastic. She's a superstar. I, I hope that she uh, does another show. I think she should have a talk show. I think she should. Oh, yeah. She could, she could do anything. She'd be great at doing a talk show. Yeah, really great. My favorite scene, I think, from that show was her and Sarah McLaughlin fighting. Oh, very funny. Yes. <laughs> Very funny. Um, Crystal wants to know if being immersed in the Canadian punk scene, now you had several experiences with SNFU. What is your favorite memory of the late Chai? It's pronounced Chai, right? Chai yeah. Pig. That's right. Oh my gosh. That is like, oh, it kills me. I have so many pictures of him and I. Um, he was such a, a sweet person. You know, he was, uh, I don't know. It, it, it makes me very... Um, I don't know, melancholic, I guess. Um, of course, he, he hasn't been gone that long, but, you know, he um, got him tongue-tied. I loved, I loved Ken. I called him Ken, but Chai is his name. And yeah. being able to sing on SNFU records was, like, the thrill of my lifetime. Like, I could have died happy yeah. every time. And I was able to perform with them uh, this song called You Make Me Thick uh, in Edmonton once and that was like that was like the big that was bigger than playing at the billboard awards it was like the biggest ex- like thrill of my life it was better than being on the tonight show it do was you remember amazing. what what venue you were at in edmondson when i feel happened? like it was the polish hall but i don't ah. know if it was um because i get mixed up with all the snf shows i attended <laughs> never mind the one i played at but yeah. ken was very very sweet he was uh, he was a very sensitive person 
and to be able to spend time with him. I used to have these two little dogs. Uh, they're, they croak now because they were so old, but he used to walk my dogs with me. Mm. And, and he was just a very thoughtful and, um, and sensitive human being. He was a really wonderful person. I hear so many good things about him for all the people yeah. in the Edmonton music scene and mm-hmm. yeah. rest in peace, yeah. man, for sure. Yeah. I'm not, I don't mean to keep things or make things too emotional. I was just going to. Okay. <laughs> Makes me happy to think about him. I'll always, I always smile when I think about Ken. You got to remember the good, the good. Mm-hmm. And for those like yourselves who, who has dealt with cancer, you are a beacon of light to the, to the rest of us to show us that you can fight this and win. So what got you through those times? While you were oh, doing being that? a goofball. Like there's no, I mean, again, you know, all I know how to do is be a performer and the class clown. Uh, so being in the wards and in the chemo wards and even in the elevator in the cancer center or anything like that, um, you know, I'm always going to make a joke. I'm always going to try and make everybody laugh um, because for me, it's a coping technique. I'm going to make fun of myself. You know, I'm going to call the radiation, my daily tanning bed. I'm going to like call chemo, you know, my, my juice medicine or whatever, you know, I just always had to make a joke. I never shut up. I'm an elevator talker and I just talked and talked and talked. I never shut up. Uh, whether it was to the nurses or other patients or to the doctor, yeah. I had a great time. You know, prior to being diagnosed with breast cancer, I was on tour with a bunch of stinky dudes, uh, you know, stuck in the back of tour buses and vans, you know, listening to their porn or, you know, <laughs> their beer cans being thrown around, you know, for like 20 years. And mm-hmm. to be immersed in a program with other breast cancer patients was the first time I was ever around that many women. Mm. And it was like a sorority. It was amazing. Um, I still have friends from that era. Uh, and, you know, I made a lot of really, really dear friends that and we never, ever would have met. Our paths would never have crossed um, had we not gone through chemo together. Wow. Had we had been in the clinical trial together. So it's really, mm. you know, it's meaningful. It's really meaningful. Uh, I never thought I was going to die uh, and I never cared, but I mean, that's how, you know, that's how I, I always say that's how kids like us always think, you know, we, most of us thought we were going to be dead at 30 because we were, you know, we had little shaved heads and romanticized what we thought, that, you know, how old that was going to be. And we, we all kind of assumed that we would have died of misadventure or some other romanticized bullshit we believed. <laughs> and, and the truth is, um, you know, I feel really lucky uh, that I did have an opportunity to, to get treatment and survive. And there's also a lot of survivor's guilt uh, mm. that I carry. And a lot of patients uh, that survive carry around because um, it's not fair. Cancer is never, no, uh, it's never kind. But we do have to focus on the fact too, that it's not always going to be a death sentence for people. They're, they're, you're either, you know, you, you can, you can win. So. Oh, I, and certainly as yeah. time goes on, I mean, the, you know, they dial in the treatments better. They're more individualized. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's incredible. And the survival rates are much better than even when I was in treatment. It's true. It's mm-hmm. true. Keeping things positive. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the new single, Broken to Your Car, which I absolutely love. Like I oh, love good. the catchy chorus, good hook. Good. Yeah. The, dr- the drums really stood out to me in a great way too on the verse and like the pre-chorus. Oh, I'm so glad. I, yeah, like it was little nuances I really enjoyed. So Very cool. the new single, is it out on the radio yet? Or is it? Um, Again, from your mouth to God's ears, you know, there's only <laughs> a few rock radio stations left in Canada. Yeah. And the, the thing with being me and putting a variety of styles on my records over the years, um, you know, some of them are too pop for rock radio and some of them are too rock for pop radio. Yeah. And that's always been the way it's been with me. And that's cool. Um, you know, when we uh, started making Champion a year ago, we just really, you know, didn't really give a shit about anything. We just wanted to make these songs um, that 
like made us happy. And um, we had our first three singles um, earmarked right away because I'm an order person. It has to go in this order. I want people to hear the songs in this order because we grew up listening to records. The album the experience. From beginning to end. Yeah. And, you know, if you just throw up your, your stuff, uh, I, I always think people cherry pick or they only get the song that they want or whatever the case. And they don't even hear the other songs sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what we really wanted to do is release Jim last year, which we did. And Broken Your Car was supposed to be released in the summer of last year. But um, I just felt uh, that, you know, my song was, did, not, did not need to get out last summer. If there are other issues going on in the world that needed amplification, definitely not a, a big naked song. You know, I was like, no, um, uh, there's other things that are more important. And so we waited. And so we were gonna put it out on New Year's and that's what we did. And, uh, and it's a fun song. It's just so much fun. And it's different from every other song. We need this. We needed this song. We need a song like this right now. Oh, good. oh it's uplifting. It's, it's, uh, yeah. It's as much as we might think the world didn't need it. We do. We do. Now, yeah. um, did you do any of the recording for champion during the year? And did it? Did uh, yes. Did and we've been able to tinker with everything because we wound up waiting instead of putting it out. Mm -hmm. last summer um and so we have tinkered with it a little there's a couple songs that i wanted to uh revisit anyway mm -hmm. uh because they they mean a lot to us it's hard not to get attached uh to yeah. some of these songs and i haven't put a i mean i have not put a record out in like nine years i can't uh, believe it's I, been that long yeah you know i'm <laughs> just busy doing other things the book came out and then we yeah. uh, did acoustic record that came out and we toured uh, doing acoustic and book tour shows for a couple of years, doing a few national tours. And so it's, you know, it's the timing is uh, really nice. It's, it's nice for me to be able to work with Doug and Snake on these songs. And um, yeah, we've got a thrash song. We've got a, you know, metal song, rock songs. We've got some really sad ballads, which I always love. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course a, a dancey song, like broken your car. What challenges did COVID present in the recording process? Do you have your own studio set up at home kind of thing? Or did you we have do. to? We do. We yeah. do. And, uh, and Doug has his own studio in London. Mm. We were able previously to go back and forth and now we have to do everything in the pro tools cloud and over FaceTime. So now it's presenting a problem because we're in lockdown in Ontario. Yeah. Um, but that's cool. You know, that's okay because we can, we still love to do the work. I mean, songwriting is, it's fun. It's a, it's a good problem to have if we're, you know, trying to figure out how to lift the bridge or what. It's a good problem to have. It's really good. Yeah. It's like making a, a puzzle in a way. I'd be sitting there just mind blown at the fact that you could even do that remotely. I would just be like, Wow, this sounds just as good. Like, <laughs> yeah, technology is amazing. Yeah. What album track of all the year, over all the years, did you ever wish would have been a single that wasn't, that was a oh deep boy. cut? Give me a deep cut. <laughs> wow. There are so, I have to laugh at some of these songs. I really like this one song called Religion. Uh, and they're always the end of records. There's, there's a song called Religion and there's a song called Welcome to the End. Yeah. Um, that is, I'm really fond of those songs. Uh, there's another one called Hold On that I always wish that some country artist would have covered instead of me singing it because I think it would have been a better song with somebody else doing it. And I feel that way about a lot of the songs. So I always say if anyone wants to cover a song, go for it. Um, but yeah, nice. there's a lot of songs that I mean, and I'm sure everybody feels that way. We like to play clips of some of the artist songs on the show. And I like to go for deep cuts oh, over the cool. singles because we've all heard the singles, right? So yeah. it's kind of cool when you find out what the artists love the most. And so oh, cool. I'll play some yeah. clips and the, new, cool. and the new song as well. Um, cool. So you went from b being grown up in Winnipeg to living in Vancouver for 30 years. And then what brought you out to Toronto? Um, well, I got married in 2016 to my guitar player snake and um nice. you know 
we had been spending a lot of time. It's like it's such a funny story. We'd been spending a lot of time in Paris, France. And, um, you know, he, he wanted to move there. Yeah. And our life there is very different than it was here. You know, we could basically be happy living on bread and water. And it's such a walk, Paris is such a walkable city. It's just like, mm-hmm. it's just so different overseas. And so I said, well, you know, if you give me a year in Montreal, then we'll consider it, you know? And, uh, and we were going to probably move to Montreal uh, parce que, you know, the <laughs> Belle Provence, you know, all the good things about it. And it's inexpensive compared to Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Um, but we flipped a coin and wound up coming to Toronto instead and loved it and loved it here. Yeah, We love it here. I mean, it's just been so much fun. We are, we BMX every summer and uh, oh, just cool. street, we just street ride. Um, but in the neighborhood that we live in, in, in South Etobicoke, there's a lot of like chop shops. There's a lot of like, there's a history of like mob crime. There's just like <laughs> so wow. much stuff. All we do is go into back lanes and like, yeah, I'll bet you there was a, there's a mob people in that, in that garage. And, you know, <laughs> just, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's so much fun being here. You were spending a lot of time in New Delhi as well, right? Uh, as Paris over the year over the years yeah you know but it's expensive to to fly and yes you know my 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 home is here I've made it a home in North America and my career you know I I love in Canada yeah cheers to Canada (laughs) yes yeah see I I mean Edmonton's home I was born and raised here but the more I travel I just, I I fall in love with all these other places and I'm like, why doesn't, why can't Edmonton be like this? But then you come home and you realize why you're here. Yes, Edmonton's (laughs) a great city, great city. Community, family, that's, and the music scene here is pretty tight too, so. It's amazing, it is amazing. Yeah, I've been playing, first time I played in Edmonton uh, was 1989. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. Great memories. Yeah. I saw you Great play memories. Boonstock, the festival just outside. Oh, wow. That's, been, that's probably been 10 years now, I think. Amazing. Loads of fun. So I think much Sick fun. had just come out. Yes. Around that time. Yep. It was a sweet show. I learned a lot from you as a front woman. Watching oh, cool. Show. I loved it. Very loved cool. It. Very cool. I want to talk about your tattoos. Now, do you have you designed any of them yourself? Um, I have to think about it. Have I designed any of them? Well, I, um, yeah, when my dogs died, I drew their pictures, uh, and had those tattooed. And then my, um, my husband doodles on all of my books, all my like calendar books and stuff like that. My journals, he'll draw a a doodle, Mm. which is just a cartoon, him giving me the finger, or a knife or something like that. And so I tattooed that stuff on me too. But um, mostly, you know, over the years, it, it's whatever I'm into at the time. You know, if I'm really affected by something, I would wound up wanting to get uh, some either symbolism or a word tattooed yeah. on me. And that's just kind of how I've, how I've always rolled over the years. I studied Taoism, I studied Buddhism, and of course had a, had a deep uh, connection with yoga, Hinduism, and uh, of wow. course, Hare Krishna. And I mean, yeah, I just, I, I just have always loved tattoos. And they just kind of play a part in telling your story throughout your life, I imagine. I guess so. It's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like recording your stories in your skin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't even have a tattoo, but I always want to know what everybody else's tattoos mean to them. Oh, very cool. Very I'm just cool. too scared. <laughs> I would love to get more. I would love to get more. But, you know, now that I'm getting a little older, it's like funny. Uh, the tattoo artist I worked with on this Ganesh I have on the side of my ribs, he, I kept telling him, you know, my elbow, I should get my elbows done and my knees done. And he just kind of said, well, you know, old skin doesn't necessarily behave the same way (laughs) and I thought what yeah I guess that's very true I mean our elbow skin is super tough 
and maybe as you get older it gets just like tougher I don't know I never but- think about uh uh, putting lotion on my elbows actually it's probably no. a good idea. <laughs> I always say when people say what advice do you have for young women I always say sunscreen on your hands for god's sake sunscreen on the hands so you don't wind up with always. witch hands because all us generation x girls will have hands like witches you know because we're yeah. just out in the sun so it's funny and then you got to try and get them tattooed, to, you know, camouflage that, confuse and distract, I always say. <laughs> but then really, you know, I have a buddy who had their hand tattooed with the face of their cat. And their mm. hand swelled up like a baseball mitt. Right after the tattoo? Yeah, for days and days. And I was like, yeah, no, no. Yeah, no, I just, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Not the spot. I do dishes, man. I do dishes in my home. It's like, what would happen? You know, my, my hand would always be wet. What would it rot? Like, no, I can't. Yeah, no. It'd probably so, like start to like bleed. The color would probably start to bleed over time. Something, something. Not something blood, go, but like color. Would go amiss. Yeah, it would fade <laughs> out. Like microblading. I haven't tried that, but I've been tempted, but I'm like, uh, you have to go to the right person. Yeah. I've got <laughs> good natural like, eyebrows, so I don't. You're lucky. Much. You're lucky. Yeah, I count my blessings. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Was it difficult for you to go vegan? No, I've been vegan so long I can't even remember. Yeah. Um, and I always will be. I've never married one, and I'm on my third husband. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that for me, it just was something that. Uh, I really wanted to lean into when I was in my early 20s and it kind of went hand in hand with being straight edge. Um, You know, I, we evolve Mm -hmm. as we get older, you know, as we get educated, as we learn more about something. And so definitely um, the, the way I'm vegan now is different from when I was 22. Um, Yeah. Also, well, hopefully, well, I, when I was 22, I would still wear, you know, Nikes. I would still wear, um, you know, cowboy boots right. on stage, you know, and now I wouldn't buy cowboy boots because they're leather or I would yeah. like go out of my way to try and buy something that was vegan. And back then also that stuff wasn't available. That's right. That's true. Not really. You know, it was really hard to find. Mm-hmm. Um, and now it's very prevalent everywhere. Um, you know, th- things are vegan that are fashion, hi- high fashion, even there's makeup that's vegan and cruelty free. And that wasn't uh, available, you know, when we were young women. So yeah. things have changed a lot. It's very easy now. It's easy for people to be vegan. Yeah, it's very easy. But that's what um, I always hear from people is that's the, one of the reasons they don't do it is because I think it would be so hard to plan your meals and all of that. But I, why are they chefs? Are these people <laughs> chefs? Like, really? Is it hard now? I don't know. I never tell anybody um, how to eat ever. I just do what I do. And for a long time, yeah. I was a raw food vegan. Uh, so I've never eaten vegan, uh, like vegan fake meat or vegan hot dogs and stuff like that. I never mm. ate it because we couldn't afford it. And it's expensive. Mm. And that stuff's still expensive now. Yeah. Um, you know, being on tour for so many years, I could guarantee myself I could get a banana. I could get oranges after the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could eat apples throughout the day. I could somehow find a salad, even if it was a Subway salad with nothing on it. Mm-hmm. And that's basically how I existed for years and years and years and years mm-hmm. uh, until I was finally home long enough, which was during my cancer treatment. And all I wanted to eat when I was going through chemo was rice. Yeah. All I wanted was rice, cooked rice. That's all I wanted. That and yams. Mm. And when we in Vancouver, I could get, you know, yam rolls. So it was like, you know, it it changed my diet in that I stopped being a raw food vegan and started being a vegan that eats rice and, and chickpeas, you know, and stuff like that and and oh there's so much you can do with chickpeas i love chickpeas they're probably my favorite food i mean little dog loves chickpeas too um yeah i i I love i love uh cooking and uh and i think it's 
I mean, of course, in my eyes, it's really easy for anybody to go vegan, especially now because they have so many fake meats. Yeah. Um, but it's not it, it's not cheap. And so and that doesn't make sense for most people. It's expensive. Vegetables are you know? so expensive in general. They are. They are for sure. Yeah. And so it's it's hard to eat uh, seasonal and local sometimes, especially if you live in a remote place or where it's not prevalent. Um, you do you have the best you can? Do you have a gardening area? No, yeah. I live in an apartment. Yeah, and uh, and we wanted we chose an apartment because Snake didn't want to have like a yard, mm-hmm. and we didn't want to really be on the ground floor. We like being in a tower, and it was great. But I think now we're starting to outgrow it now that we have a a, a dog, and uh, we someday will. We always say someday we'll get a house, but I can't imagine when and where that's going to be. What's your favorite dish to cook? Oh, wow. I, I love making Indian food. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would, I mean, for me, it's going to be like eggplant. Always. I love eggplant. It's my favorite food. A lot of people say you, you can't eat nightshades. And it's like, um, that's all I eat. <laughs> zucchinis. <laughs> I love zucchinis. I love tomatoes. I love, I love eggplant. Um, but I would, yeah, I, I love making Indian food. So it, any vegetable possible i'm gonna make it into a curry oh cool cool i'd love to learn to cook indian food oh it's easy and now with uh with the all the internet searches anyone can make anything there it's so easy now um i'm gonna kind of go towards the end of the interview now and i'm gonna touch on some things that are very nostalgic mostly um to wrap things up from the shows and the tv appearances and the concerts you did um back in the 90s um much music who are some of your favorite hosts and shows to visit oh my gosh i mean everything like sukian was i mean she was one of our heroes she was an idol for sure uh Teresa was because she did the metal show um and that was like you know she was a a woman doing the metal show and this is after Dan Gallagher who was like power hour we used to run home and watch it uh but Master T you know still um is a hero and uh I don't know Jen Hollett and there's just so many there's just so many obviously Rick the Temp you know just yeah it was uh kids today they don't know they just don't know how cool it was the power of the vj it was amazing you know they really were our heroes and we looked up to them and we watched them and adored them Uh, i i also have to say monica Dior. Mm -hmm. um you know for us she was a supermodel and electric circus was yeah just like we all grew up on that stuff and uh and yeah, it was very serendipitous times. Um, I spoke to Erica M for the show. And uh, ah. did you know about her new podcast, The Reinvention of the D- of the VJ? Oh, cool. So that she talks brilliant. to she, each week. She talks to one of the VJs that were at much. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, I have to. I recommend it. <laughs> very cool. What was your favorite music video of yours to make? Well, we're not going to take it. Uh, it was a remake of the Twisted Sister song. Mm. And we were able to shoot a video um, with uh, the guys from the Ready to Rumble movie. So Sting, the wrestler. Um, yeah, there's uh, he was like, for us, he was like the, the champ, the hero. Um, That's cool. David Arquette, Scott Kahn. You know, it was just like, yeah, it was so much fun. It was just so much fun to do that. I'm going to have to go watch that again. It was so fun. It was just (laughs) insane. It was so much fun. Have you always felt like you were a natural stage performer or did you get stage fright at any point in your career? Uh, I still get stage fright. I think when I first did my first tour after chemo uh, was the worst. I was ready to quit altogether. I was just completely uh, a shell of who I was. I was embarrassed every show. Um, I just, I I had really short hair and a lot of women that I knew anyway, who are going through breast cancer treatment, like me, put on 30 pounds, uh, during chemo as a result of just a variety of things as you know, your hormones change, you're thrown into menopause. I was only 35, 36. 
Um, so it was a big change. And I was anorexic before that. So it was a big change. And I looked very different, in my opinion. Wow. Uh, and then the short hair. And uh, it just was really, I just felt embarrassed. Every show, I just felt embarrassed. So it was just, ugh, it was so hard. Um, but eventually, you know, I just, I guess I just got used to it and, and kind of uh, got over it, you know, and, uh, and just got into touring again, but it took a really long time for me to be comfortable. I was just, I was like, yeah. That's when I, really, really hard. when I got to see you live was when you had the ah. short hair and you oh. had just completed like, like I'd say within the last five years before that was when you completed treatment, but it was like, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have known that you felt that way because like oh, I it was, said, it was terrible and it went on for years. And, and a lot of ladies will tell you this, maybe guys too with, with, cancer I'm not sure but it, it takes years even if your chemo is done mm -hmm. uh, then you still have radiation and then when that's done maybe you're still on a biological infusion or maybe like me then you suddenly have to get an ovarectomy you oh. know a year and a half later and then you're in like absolute menopause and then you deal with menopause stuff which is weird see that um, that would, yeah it's weird that would probably throw your emotions for a loop too Right. It, was it changes insane. your pain. It was just, but you know, like you're on stage or in front of people, you can't really, I mean, at the time anyway, and I've always been that kind of performer that no matter what was going on for me backstage or back home or in real life, mm -hmm. the stage was still the stage because that was just our generation. And that's just how it was. And it was all about the mosh pit. And it was all about, you know, rocking. And for me, it was all about being able to hit my notes. Chemo changed my voice a lot. And really? I did not sing properly for, I mean, it seems to me now it's like for years, but it was a long time where I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't sing right. Uh, but eventually it just, yeah, eventually you get, you get through it. You feel like it came back to you where it needed to be again? Like oh, vocally. definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of times where we think that we don't sound good, but we, to other people, we sound good, but it's just how it feels in your own throat and body. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, when I saw you also, like you still commanded that stage and you look strong, you looked good and you just, you. you need to know you were awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a, an amazing time. It was a very powerful time in my life. I'm glad that you saw that show. Absolutely. Um, a concert that you've seen that changed your life that you've been well, to. I would say Bad Brains at CBGB's 2006 with what John a, Joseph from uh, Crow Mag singing. What a venue too. It was amazing. It was amazing. And it's better to see a show there. Well, I mean, I can say that now. I was like, it's better to see a show than play there. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, it was just uh, an amazing band. So it was, yeah, it was a pretty, a pretty life altering show. You've got to have a lot of really cool experiences. And I'm so glad that you've shared so much with me today. And I want to uh, ask for the last question, what food item, clothing item, toy, anything makes you nostalgic for the nineties? Oh, wow. So many things. Oh my gosh. Doc Martens. Yes. You know, Doc Martens were like, I always wanted Docs when I was young and we couldn't afford them. Um, and now, of course, they make vegan Docs. So, you know, everyone yeah. can have those, uh, those burgundy Doc eight holes or 10 holes. Um, it's cool. You know, they, they're always going to remind me of, of that era, of that, I that love era them. for sure. I love docs. Oh yeah, me too. What a good choice. <laughs> oh, you know what? It's meant so much to me that you took the time to talk today. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank yeah. you. Your show's amazing. Thank you. You're a hero to me. So I, I oh. wish you all the best. Thank you. And as soon as this episode comes out the week of, I'll just tag you. Well, I'll send you maybe an email through, um, through Eric yes. and then, yes, and then please. just to let you know, and then I'll tag you on the social media stuff. Awesome. I would look, love that. We're looking in about I'm really ahead of schedule. So we're looking at about, uh, I forgot when I was going to put it out. It'll probably be a more than a month away, but then uh, what is the champion release? I don't know. We've got our third single 
kind of ready. It's sitting there in the in the pipe, but I I want to do a video for it when we put it out. So okay, I think it'll be. I'm hoping that we'll be putting it out by summer. I would like to do. Well, I don't want to go as late as summer to put this out, but I wanted to kind of coincide it with when the album was coming out. So it would be I understand to, to help you um, have that promotion for it. Thank so. you. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. We'll be, we'll look at like a couple months or so and then see. Okay. But Very cool. I'll keep posted. And thanks again. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, have a wonderful night. Thanks for staying up late for me. <laughs> no problem. Stay safe and healthy. You too. All and right. Hopefully I see you soon. Absolutely. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.